so hi everyone and welcome to this uh, platform, this online platform seminar. So today the speaker is Aslem Bedre de Foli, um, talking about hybrid platform models and joint work with Simon Anderson. Um, so the rules, I guess, I mean, most of you are used to them anyway. So uh, if you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat. Uh, Uslem will stop from time to time for clarification questions and for more substantive ones, uh, we can keep that uh, at the end after Eski's uh, discussion. I think I've said what I had to say. So Uslem, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you, everyone, for being here uh, today. Good morning, good afternoon. So uh, so this is a joint work with Simon, who is also here in the audience. So I'm happy that he will pick up the difficult questions. So we analyze hybrid platform models before going into our, our modeling setup. And I want to just motivate why we are looking at these models in particular. So we have seen significant increase of e-commerce as a retail revenue in the last years, in particular during the coronavirus times. So this amounted to 10% of retail revenue in the US. So Amazon appears to be the dominant player of the e-commerce markets, both in US and in Europe. So we, these are the market shares that Amazon has in these countries, but situation is pretty similar in most of European countries. And Amazon has this business model called hybrid platform model that is basically Amazon enables interactions between third party product sellers and buyers just in basically taxes then the transactions of these third party products and it also sells its own products this could be private labels of Amazon like Amazon basics or branded products that Amazon purchases from the wholesale market and resells them in as a retailer on its platform. So that's what we call the hybrid platform. So if you look at the percentage of these uh, sales coming from the third parties versus Amazon retail channel, 53% of all paid units were sold by third parties in 2019. So this is a global number. And this number is even higher in the US, so around 70%. So that tells us that the major or the majority of the Amazon uh, volume of sales are coming from the third party products uh, compared to the retail channel. And Amazon is not the only hybrid platform. So we have Apple App Store and Google Play as a hybrid platforms. They have their own apps on the app uh, store, but also they enable interaction between third party apps and the users. And the Zalando is also another example of a hybrid platform. So why we are interested in, in particular, dominant hybrid platforms, because they have raised significant antitrust concerns recently, both in Europe and in the US, and in other countries, I believe will follow up the suite. And in particular, in the European Commission Amazon investigation, there was a recent press release about that, which was basically emphasizing uh, important aspects of this investigation, mainly three key concerns. So the one concern was that Amazon might be favoring its own products. So these are Amazon retail products at the disadvantage of the third parties. And Amazon might be distorting access of the third party sellers to the consumers. That's an argument made for the basically entry level of these third party product sellers to the Amazon marketplace. And the, finally, Amazon might be using third party sales data for its own product decisions in the retail channel. Okay, so there were three key issues. And uh, beside these concerns, of course, these were also important concerns for the US investigation. So we also see another public debate going on, which is taxing digital platforms. And France introduced tax in 2019, July, basically imposing a digital tax for Amazon around 3% of its marketplace activities because Amazon passed this threshold of the revenue, both for the, from the global sales as a, you know, the, being a big digital platform, but also its own sales in the French market. And basically Amazon made a counter strike uh, by passing entire amount of this tax onto it is third party sales uh, commissions. Uh, basically Amazon announced that it's gonna increase its third party commissions for French sellers in the Amazon point FR market by exactly amount of the tax. So it's important to understand this business model of hybrid platforms also to characterize what would be the optimal taxation policy uh, for these platforms. And another fact is that Amazon is very fee, so I don't want to spend so much time, but it's just to highlight that, you know, first point fees vary across categories, but there might be also the same fees 
across different categories. So module fee is around 15%, and these are the fees applied to the third party sales revenue. Okay, and sellers mostly don't pay fixed fees. So these are commissions over the revenue raised by the third party sellers. And, but these fees range a lot. So they can go from 6%, say, for on personal competitors up to 96% for warranties. Another observation is that Amazon activity as a retailer is also different across categories. So for instance, Amazon is big in entertainment of goods and products, and it's around 20% of its total retail activities coming from this channel. So there is this variance of how big Amazon in a retail channel across categories, but also how the commissions change across categories. So we would like to build up a model, basically try to understand the main ingredients of these uh, decisions, how big I want to be in a given category, what does it depend on, but also given that I choose as a platform, my optimal business model, how this would affect the equilibrium properties. So prices. So what we are doing is basically we provide a micro-funded model to study trade platforms. Uh, in particular, we would like to capture important aspects such as the consumers making membership and transaction decisions. So they decide to enter and then they also decide whether to purchase on the platform. And the third party products have this entry decisions, which was an important point of the European Commission investigation as an access to the, uh, the consumers of the monopoly platform. And the monopoly platform can influence this uh, participation of third party sellers and also consumers and also the transactions on the platform via two tools. It can raise revenues from commissions over the third party sales, but it can also sell its own products. So this is an endogenous decision and make more profits from its own products. And then we analyze how this dual role of a monopoly hybrid platform affects basically the prices variety and third party sellers and consumer welfare. So this is what we are doing. And very briefly, I would like to just emphasize the previous literature and how we are connected. Basically, if you look at the two-sided markets literature, we have this either participation models that are basically standard, you know, the, the nightclub type models, modeling participation decisions of buyers and sellers on both sides or transaction models like the payment card models introduced by Roche and Troll. And we would like to incorporate both because we believe that they are important for the e-commerce platforms. And also we want to have this between group negative externality, which is mainly arising from competition between sellers in a given category. So this is important aspect of, of our model because it will also affect Amazon or the platform decision of whether to present its own product or not. Okay, And there has been literature on that, but they were looking at the impact of the ex these externalities on competition between platforms. We are different in the sense that we just look at the have this hybrid platform model works when we have these externalities within the product category due to the competition. Okay. And the, this is a model of a variety provision by a play, trade platform. But again, different from these previous papers, we enable platform to charge both participation margin, so it can make revenue from participation margin, but also that from the transaction margin. And these margins are distinct. So this is an important part of the paper. So in our paper, basically, we will generate this two-sided uh, network effects endogenously because of transaction surpluses affected by the platform endogenously in the model. This will be clearer when I introduce. And very recently there have been papers, so I think they are complementary in what we are doing here because they look at different aspects of these different investigations on the hybrid platforms. So I will not want to go to into details, but I'm happy to discuss at the end. So we are different from those in particular we have variety aspect differentiated products. So this is the key difference from the first paper where the products are homogeneous, except for one seller being uh, offering a higher quality. And also from the second paper, so they have a very different focus. So there are capacity constraints and, and uh, there were different issues like the platform can provide access to the information about the sales and we don't do these things. And also uh, the, there's a paper by Etro and that's also different from what we are doing here. Okay, so let me go back to the general model. So what we are doing here is uh, basically we are modeling trade platform and uh, this trade platform enables interactions between buyers, mass of buyers and a continuum of differentiated sellers. So what does it mean enabling interactions? Basically sellers decide whether to come to the platform at, by paying a fixed cost of entry K, but this is not a fixed fee to the platform. So this is exogenous. And buyers decide whether to visit the platform, but again, they don't pay a fixed fee and they face this intrinsic visiting cost S, okay? 
And then there is this, uh, once sellers on board, they decide also the prices, okay? And how the timing works, the platform first decides whether it wants to also own its own product. And if it has its own product, so basically these two stages could be boiled down to one. I just put them separately to make it clear. It sets its own price of the product if it is it selling its own product. In other words, it's a hybrid platform. And it also chooses this commission on the sales of the third party sellers. Okay. And the then third party sellers decide whether to enter. So this is third stage and they choose their prices if they enter. And fourth stage consumers decide, decide whether to visit the platform. And if they visit the platform, they incur this intrinsic visiting cost S and then they discover their match values to the products on the platform. So on the platform, consumers can buy from the third-party seller product. So this then they get this utility the UI, which is basically quality of the third-party good minus its price plus the match value to the product. And if they if there is availability of the platform product, they can also buy it the platform product, and that is gives them a different quality, which is VA minus price of the product. And again, they have this match value to that product. And they can also walk away if they basically cannot find anything better than what they have as an outside option. Okay. And uh, basically in the, so why we call this model like a mix oligopoly, because we have this symmetrically differentiated fringe sellers on the platform. So they are infinitesimal in the sense that when they choose their prices, they do not have an effect on the equilibrium uh, price of the, the market. So they are small. But the platform has a mass of products, so it has this uh, impact on the equilibrium, which makes them different than a symmetric oligopoly framework. Okay, so we use this mixed oligopoly framework that was adapted by early literature on the trade and the general equilibrium models. Okay, and also we have this long run aggregated games aspect in the model that simplifies our lives, as we will see very soon uh, a lot. Uh, this is given by this free entry decision of the third party sellers. What we have in mind is that we think about third party sellers having this fluid entry decisions. In other words, the entry can happen any time. So the basic entry stage, there is no friction. So that's why we consider this entry fluent and that will give us this uh, long run aggregative games properties of the model. Basically that will simplify again the, the the structure of the solution. And we also adopt this Weizmann search rule, but today I'm not gonna talk about it, but just let me briefly describe what it is. So we, we have two different versions with the search cost. So one version is when consumer incurs the cost and then discovers all the match values on the platform, including this outside option. So this I will discuss today. This is what we call the two-sided market analysis today. But there's also other version where consumers know they are outside option before visiting. So this is basically the Weizmann search rule and they decide whether to incur the cost to discover the other match values on the platform. Okay. And indeed uh, we have some results, but this part is still work in progress and I'm not going to present it today. So, but we, we are confident that our qualitative results apply there too. And what are the assumptions of so platform is viable? So in other words, it has sufficiently, the fixed cost of entry for the free sellers is sufficiently low. That means when the platform charges zero commission, there will be some sellers coming to the platform. And we also assume this match values are IID to the product. So this uh, epsilon terms are IID with the gamble distribution. So that's why we will get this logic type demands but again, it will be a little bit different from the standard logic due to the fact that we will have this mixed oligopoly structure. Okay. And we will solve this uh, multi stage game using the basically sub game perfect Nash equilibrium. So maybe Ash is a good point to pose and see if there are any questions on the model. So you yes. see, you see as a, a question of terminology why is it mixed oligopoly rather than monopoly with competitive fringe? Yes, I think that will be clear once I describe the demand. So mix oligopoly because uh, uh, the, yeah, let's go there. Yeah, so it's not the monopoly um, because they are, because um, so I think Yossi has in mind that when, when the, the fringe sellers are choosing their prices, they can't affect the equilibrium. So it's basically monopolistic 
competition framework. He's right in pointing this step. But uh, we think about also this uh, mix oligopoly, like Amazon having, say, massive products, right? Each product of Amazon could also be very small, but it has this mass of products that it controls the prices and they, if they are symmetric. So that's how we call it, you know, uh, the, its presence comes from owning this a big junk of the products in the market, okay? okay. So um, yeah, because of the interpretation, but, I, but he's right in terms of solution is monopolistic, uh, Seller competition, yeah. Uh, on a more uh, technical point of view, I'm not sure I understand the, the setup perfectly. So th there is no search. I mean, once you pay the search cost, you learn all the values, right? You know, yeah. you learn all the epsilon. But if there yes. is a continuum of sellers, uh, doesn't that mean that there will always be uh, several uh, uh, sellers that for which the epsilon is, is at the, the upper bound so that those guys are essentially uh, Bertrand competing? So, you know, no, you, no, okay, so what am I missing? No. So, may, so maybe may I, I may I take yeah. that one? <laughs> yes, go ahead. You're missing the tail property of the type one extreme value distribution if you wanted to be technical. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which, uh, <laughs> if we have so, so uh, no, the no appropriate no. tails, yes. Okay. Oh, you got it? Yeah. Right. So there's always uh, something larger enough, even in the limit. So it's in, in some sense, it's the limit properties, uh, monopolistically competitive limit properties of type one extreme value distributions and other ones where the tail is uh, sort of doesn't go to isn't too thin. So you do have literally you have an equilibrium markup under monopolistic competition, even with a continuum of firms. But it's a good point that if it, you're exactly right, <laughs> if we had a bounded support, uh, then there would be, actually it wouldn't be, it would be as you said, you, you would have uh, yeah. equally high, you, you, everyone would have uh, their best valuation out there and they would go to zero. So sure. yeah. I will get out the way actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just a clarification, Auslem, the, yes. you, the sellers need to go to the platform. They cannot, uh, consumers cannot access the sellers without the platform, right? Yes, yes, okay. there is no direct channel, yeah. Okay. Any other question? No? Good. Good to go. So then uh, let me start by providing the solution of the simplest scenario where we have this visit cost not binding. So suppose that all consumers come to the platform. So this S is not binding or is zero basically, that all consumers are on board and it's all about whether I buy one product versus the other or nothing. Okay, so if the platform is a pure marketplace so that it doesn't sell its own product, we will have the demand for fringe seller I in this expression. So basically it is when the fringe seller says it's price PI and the equilibrium price of the products is P, basically, so we have the symmetric sellers, right? So we get, you know, we, they, there's a, like a continuum of them. So since they are symmetric, we have this uh, aggregate demand being the n times exponential of this uh, V minus P over mu. So the P is the price of the any seller. And now I, if I choose a price PI, I'm getting this share of the total aggregate demand, okay? But if there is a platform product available, then basically the aggregate demand of expression of the same demand equation of seller I will be different. And now it will also depend on the product of the platform. So this is A and the price of the, that platform product. And there we have this mass of the platform product. So that's why we have this M uh, in front of the platform's share of this aggregate. And that's uh, basically how it differs between these two structures of the platform business model in terms of the demand for the seller I. And the demand for the platform product is basically the, its own share of the total aggregate, okay? So these are the demand functions, again, uh, if, there is no, you know, all consumers come on board and then they just choose between either buying seller, third party seller product or nothing. If it's a pure marketplace and they choose between third party seller products or platform product or nothing if it's a hybrid platform. Okay. And then the seller's pricing decision is basically I get my price, but I have to pay this commission which is kind of a ad valorem tax for the seller. So I get one minus T of this price or the revenue and I get it over my sales. So it's over my demand. 
Here, I denote the total demand by A, basically this is the aggregate demand or the aggregate that we are referring to because it, this aggregate will not be affected by the seller pricing. So it's gonna be independent of what the seller chooses at its own price, okay? And it will have different expression between these two different business models. So aggregate will be this one when it's a pure marketplace and it will be this expression, including the platform product when it's a hybrid platform, okay? And when we solve this simple problem, basically we show that the fringe equilibrium price is simple perceived marginal cost. Why perceived? Because this is marginal cost divided by one minus T. So it's like ad valorem tax inflating my marginal cost. And then the seller, each seller puts its uh, standard logit markup on this marginal cost, okay? So this is important that, you know, this pricing is the same regardless of the business model chosen by the platform. Because of the fact that again, print sellers are infinitesimal, so they cannot affect the equilibrium, okay? And then once we take this price at the equilibrium, we can write down the fringe variable profit. And if you take basically the price times one minus T minus C, so this is the, mar the margin per unit that the fringe gets, it boils down to this expression. Basically, this is the fringe markup times one minus T, so how much it can keep uh, as opposed to paying to the platform the tax. And then this is the demand at the equilibrium price for the fringe seller, okay? And again, the aggregate is not, uh, now it's a function of just the T, so the commission of the platform. So the fringe sellers will come until the point that this total profit is equal to zero. So that will determine basically uh, the, when the, the in equilibrium, the aggregate property, the aggregate will be equal to this expression. And this is given by the, this free entry or the zero profit condition of the fringe, okay? Important properties of the aggregate is that it is a decreasing function of the commission of the platform. So when platform raises the commission, aggregate demand goes down, okay? And at commission zero, remember at the beginning, I assume that the K is sufficiently low so that there is some fringe entry. In other words, A star zero is above one. Okay, so this was our assumption on the K. And then we, we characterize that there also exists a T hat. This is the upper cutoff. Basically at T hat, fringe prefers to leave the market because it's too high commission for that. Okay, so this is when basically aggregate is equal to the outside uh, goods uh, demand. Okay, one. Okay. So then uh, given these properties are defined now, we can also write down the number of fringe products, which will basically solve the aggregate, equilibrium aggregate being equal to the definition of the aggregate to start with in the pure marketplace case. So basically that will pin down number of fringe products as a function of uh, commission set by the platform, okay? So then I can move to the pure marketplace equilibrium. So the platform basically chooses the commission that maximizes its profit. So which is T times the price that it, so this is the tax over the revenue from the third party product sales. So I write the third party product total demand as the aggregate minus the outside demand. So then this is total demand that the platform product goods have. They are not owned by the platform, but just the third party products. Again, given the pricing behavior of the seller, each seller, this is what we characterized before, and the A star T pinned down by the zero profit condition. And then the platform basically choose the optimal fee between this, the critical thresholds that I determined, de defined, basically the platform optimal fee will be less than this cutoff T had, so that there will be some fringe firms coming uh, to the platform in equilibrium and then the platform in equilibrium chooses T such that aggregate value in equilibrium will be equal to one minus the fraction of the elasticities. So what are those elasticities? So if you look at the platform objective function, so is, you can think about it basically maximizing it is the same as maximizing the log of this function. So it tells you already that there will be some elasticities here. So the first is the elasticity of the aggregate demand with respect to the commission. Remember the aggregate demand is going down with the commission. So this elasticity is negative. So this numerator is here, this term is negative. So indeed this is an expression about one. And uh, in the denominator, we have the elasticity of the fee revenue. So when the platform increases this commission, it trades off basically how much I can make from the margin. So it is my fee revenue per unit. 
and this elasticity, but then I lose the aggregate demand. So that is basically the loss. So that's the trade-off that pins down the optimal uh, commission. And what we characterize now is the illustrative uh, equilibrium, basically how it looks like. Uh, I just draw here the AT. So again, remember this is the equilibrium aggregate, which is a decreasing function of the platform commission. And at some point where AT is equal to one, fringe is not coming anymore. So this is that he had uh, upper bar, uh, he had a threshold. And the right-hand side of the equilibrium condition here, I characterize for these parameter values that it is increasing, but in most of the parameters, it is indeed monotonic, but it might be uh, non-monotonic. In other words, we might have multiple equilibria for, uh, for some uh, values of, for instance, in particular, when the differentiation is very high or the marginal cost is super low, that can happen. But again, this is a space uh, rather uh, tight. But we don't need uh, the uniqueness. Indeed, our properties are also applying uh, as long as we have the existence, because we will do some comparative statics analysis to the equilibrium, and that will be uh, clear next. Okay. So what we do is, for instance, uh, when we think about the fixed fee of entering for the fringe, if k goes down, so it is basically uh, easier for fringe firms to operate on the platform, so the fixed cost is lower. Then this AT, uh, equilibrium aggregate, will shift right, and that will result in platform charging higher commission in equilibrium. Okay. I think this is a good point to pose to get if there is any question on the pure marketplace equilibrium. No? Okay. Then we go and ask a question, what would happen if it was a hybrid platform? So then as we know already, the fringe sellers pricing behavior is the same because they are infinitesimal. So they are not affecting the aggregate. And again, since the prices are the same, their cost, their profit expression is the same and the zero profit condition will again pin down the equilibrium aggregate as before. And that will give us the neutrality property of this aggregate demand or the aggregate that means basically the equilibrium aggregate is independent of uh, price of the platform product and the quality of the platform product. And that will simplify our lives a lot. And that will be very important in the in analyzing this comparative statics of the equilibrium. Okay. So then platform profit will look like this new expression. So before it was commission times price of the fringe seller times the demand from the third party sales. Now I also have my own product. So that's why we deduct this VA uh, in, from the aggregate demand. So VA is basically the, the, the how much of the platform products gets from the aggregate demand. And I have this, uh, my own margin from this aggregate demand. Okay, so VA, I didn't put it here, but it's basically M times exponential small VA minus PA over me. Okay, how much I get from the aggregate demand for my own product. And then if we solve this equation, first uh, characterize the equilibrium price of the platform product, that gives us a very nice intuitive formula, which is basically, what is the opportunity cost of selling my own product on the platform? It is the cost of this product, the marginal cost, plus how much revenue I lose from the third party products when I sell this product instead, because they are competing, okay? So that's why we have this, the loss revenue uh, if I sell my own product, this is basically commission times the price of the third party product that I would have sold if I didn't sell my own product. Okay. And mu is the standard markup on top of this uh, opportunity cost. And one observation is that in order to, for instance, if you have the price of the, so the marginal cost of the platform product, the same as the marginal cost of the fringe product. So CA is the same as C, we can see the platform product is higher price in equilibrium than the fringe product, okay? So at equal marginal pro prices, marginal cost, they, a platform product has higher price. But given that we observe Amazon products being priced lower in general, again, this is anecdotal evidence, in order to get that, basically, if in order to have the platform product being lower than the fringe product price in equilibrium for a given commission level, marginal cost of the platform product should be sufficiently low. And this can be indeed justified by the fact that the Amazon might have some buyer power in the wholesale market when it purchases, for instance, the branded products, as opposed to these small uh, retailers who are selling them as third-party sales on Amazon. 
Okay, so the CA could be indeed considered as the purchasing price in the wholesale market of the Amazon product. Okay. Uh, so, and so then, as an, yeah. uh, if I may, before you, you go on, there's yeah. a question, I actually had the same question. So can you tell us again why it is that the, the existence of a first party product does not affect third party pricing? Does not affect oh. the seller's pricing? So because of the, you know, the sellers cannot affect the, the fringe sellers, the third party sellers are so small, so they cannot affect the aggregate demand, right? So when they are pricing, they take this aggregate demand constant, like independent of their pricing behavior. So what they basically try to fix is how much I get from this aggregate. Given that aggregate is fixed, what will be my share of this aggregate? This price. is my margin. Their own pricing does not depend on the, the pricing by other sellers. Is that because when you introduce an, 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 a big seller, the first party the one, it doesn't change ex- this response? Put it this way, price expression does not depend, but price expression is a function of the commission. But the commission in equilibrium will depend on whether platform product, how it is priced and how whether there is platform product or not. Okay. So the expression of the pricing formula, optimal pricing of the fringe seller is the same. So the, the yeah. best response does not depend uh, on, on other sellers' pricing. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Because of again the fact that the, this each seller is so small, it cannot affect the the equilibrium pricing behavior of uh, the rival. Okay. 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 More. Okay, so then the lemma tree basically characterizes equilibrium for the hybrid platform optimal commission. Again, there is a cutoff, but this is a different one now, because uh, given that platform product is available on the platform, basically then uh, this maximum, you know, the commission about which there is no more fringe seller is now lower, right? Because it has to also compete against the platform product. So there's this another cutoff which determines you know, if platform charges a commission above this level, there basically will be no uh, third party sellers. In other words, platform turns itself effectively a pure reseller of its own product. And what we show is that if platform product quality is above a cutoff VA tilde, so if I have a sufficiently high quality product, indeed, I prefer to turn off the third party sales channel and became a pure reseller in the model. Okay, because they are creating competition mm-hmm. against my product and they, it doesn't pay off to have their variety if my product quality is sufficiently high. But if my product quality is low, then there exists a trash, the, the optimal commission between these levels so that that allows some fringe firms to enter. Okay. And what we will do now is basically consider this area where platform is effectively hybrid. In other words, fringe, some fringe firms are there and platform is the own product and ask the question of how this equilibrium changes if the platform products gets better, okay? So basically, if the quality of the platform product goes up within this region or the platform marginal cost of the product goes down, how does this affect the equilibrium? And we show that this is the main result of the paper that the hybrid platform charges a higher commission to third party sellers if its product gets better, okay? So let me describe the intuition of this result because given that it's a key for the rest of the results. So what happens when platform quality increases? So obviously platform product gets better so it's still some demand from the third party products. So that means that in equilibrium there will be fewer fringe firms coming to the platform. So this N small N will go down it goes down such that this increase in quality of the platform product normally will increase the aggregate demand, but because of this free entry condition, remember we showed this aggregate demand being constant in the platform quality. So this aggregate will not change when the A goes up. So because of this fringe basically variety going down neutralizes the quality increase of the platform product. But then what happens is that platform gets a larger share of this given aggregate demand when its quality is higher. And so it puts more weight on its profit expression for the retail chain chain revenues or the profits as opposed to the profits that it makes on the third party sales activities, okay? In other words, this fraction increases when VA, small VA goes up 
And this market share of the third party products goes down when the platform products gets better. So then I'm balancing these two channels and I put more emphasis on my retail channel. So then it pays off to raise the commission to the third parties because I, they are my competitors, right? So that basically leads a higher commission in equilibrium, okay? And the same argument applies for when marginal cost of the platform product goes down. Then the corollary is that equilibrium share of the platform product increases in the market when its quality goes up or its marginal cost goes down, okay? So that can tell us some, you know, some nice predictions for the, you know, if you compare this across categories, you know, I show you this uh, fees at the beginning. Indeed, if you remember, I told you that the Amazon retail channel is big for the clothes and accessories. And these are the clothes and accessories also has a higher, relatively higher commission, for instance, 17%. I'm not saying that our model explains everything there because also the categories have different views or the different differentiations across categories, but this is just anecdotal evidence that kind of, uh, you know, what we predict is that when platform product is big, we predict to have the commission higher in equilibrium of our model. And the, the consumer surplus in this model is basically the log of the aggregate demand. And this is very simple because the aggregate demand basically tracks how consumer surplus changes. And we know that the aggregate demand is function of the optimal, the equilibrium commission set by the platform. And as we have already shown, this equilibrium commission goes up when platform product gets higher quality or lower cost. So basically then this is bad news for consumers, okay? Because of the fact that again, increasing quality of the platform product is neutralized by the lack of variety due to the free entry of the third party products. And what happens is that because of the business model of the platform, balancing these retail rev profits versus the third party profits platform puts more weight on the retail revenues profits. So that increases the commission that results in the lowering the consumer surplus, okay? But this is remarkable because in general, we know that the quality increase is good news for consumer welfare in standard IO models. But this is not true here due to the platform's business model. So in other words, if Amazon was not able to con control the tax on the third party products, it, there wouldn't be this channel that it affects the consumer welfare negatively, okay? So that's an important property. It's basically related to the, it's driven from the business model of the platform being hybrid, okay? Aslam, you, you have- yeah. Two minutes, no? Yeah, a couple of minutes left. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so then I have to be very quick here. So I think I don't have time. Uh, what we did is basically we look at the platform optimal choice between pure marketplace versus hybrid. And we show that, uh, again, if the platform quality uh, of the product is below some cutoff, platform prefers to be a pure marketplace. So this is this uh, profit. And if it is above a cutoff, it prefers to be hybrid. Why it is the case? In general, if there is no fixed cost of the platform product, platform is always preferred, preferring here to be a hybrid platform because it's always good to have some variety. But when you have some fixed cost of introducing your own product, then basically this it creates this cutoff point. But it is always uh, basically good news for the consumers if the policymakers ban the hybrid mode in the model. Okay, and then uh, we characterize basically all these thresholds where the platform uh, chooses which market mode. And important thing is that when the product differentiation in the market increases, the region where the hybrid mode becomes uh, profitable increases. Okay, so this is another uh, nice uh, prediction of the mode. Okay, so uh, given that I'm over time, so in the two sided market, so let me just go direct and say what we have as the main results that I showed you hold here. So in other words, even though we have the elastic participation demands on the consumer side, we get again the key result that the hybrid platform equilibrium commission goes up when its product has a higher quality or lower cost so that the consumers are again worse off. And again, banning the hybrid platform mode in the market benefits consumers when also we allow this elastic participation. So two-sided market has nice, interesting properties I'm happy to discuss after the talk because I think we also generate a non-linear network effects in the model because of 
this uh, endogenous uh, transaction surpluses uh, in the e-commerce model. Okay, so let me go direct to you and uh, this is my last slide. So final points. So I showed you at the beginning this concerns about the steering. So what we can do is we can analyze in our model what does it mean steering? So just very shortcut uh, introduction, basically, if platform has an ability to raise the quality of the third party products, so the small v, it prefers that it, they are better because they are stealing demand from outside good. But it also has a possibility of increasing its own quality va or m. Again, it prefers to do that. But if there's a trade off, like if I want to push my product above when I'm pushing the other's product down, let's suppose that steering does this, Basically, I'm increasing perceived quality of my own product at the cost of lowering the perceived quality of the fringe products. And this becomes profitable if platform product has a high quality, okay? It's not always the case, but if it has a high quality, it prefers to do that. But this is exactly the case where the commissions are high. So that's the point where this could be harmful. And for the taxation point that I raised at the beginning, so basically unit tax on the platform product will benefit consumers. Again, that will lower the commission to the third parties, but what happened in the French case, taxing the marketplace uh, uh, revenues is not a good news because that basically lowers the weight that the platform puts on the third party revenues. So that basically results in increasing the commissions to the third party sellers. That's what we observed also from the Amazon reaction. I stop here. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take other questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Aslan. Uh, so now Heski Barizak is going to discuss the paper. Heski. Sure. So um, let me start by saying that I've uh, never worked for Amazon or any other interested party here. I think when we're dealing with these sort of big policy relevant um, issues, it's, it's worth reiterating that when, when it's the case uh, or disclosing when it's not the case. Um, so I don't think this, this, this paper needs a lot of motivation. This is obviously a, a big question. A lot of people are asking the same question. I think the key insight um, that, that I got from here is um, you know, the hybrid model obviously makes life tougher for rivals. If, if Amazon is offering stuff, it's harder for rivals. Could, um, and part of what makes it harder is because then Amazon wants to benefit its own uh, goods and so raises the, the fees. Um, this tougher life for rivals is then reducing product entry, reducing variety, and that's an effect that makes consumers up worse off. Now, why is that the dominant effect? Because we also have the effect that, you know, Amazon's stuff is good for consumers. Why, why it's necessarily the effect that the, uh, uh, um, you know, um, hit on rival entry is the dominant effect. That was a little bit more mysterious to me. And, and it's hard to know, going back to kind of Alex's question, whether this is about mysterious properties of what's going on in the tails and how thick these tails are and, and, and so on. And with different distributions, God, God knows what happens. Si Simon's laughing. I don't know whether that's because I'm wrong or, or just he gets as confused about tail properties as I do. Um, so, so, so that's kind of the, the big picture of what, what, what I took from this. Um, I'm going to give a few comments to sort of more specific to the model and then sort of zoom out to the, to the big picture a little bit. Um, so, I mean, one question here is, is, is consumer surplus the right well measure of welfare? Um, so, you know, I mean, we have other ways to measure welfare, like total surplus. And, um, you know, Mankey and Winston tell us sometimes there's uh, excess entry when, when, when there's fixed costs. So kind of, you know, jumping from, from that to policy, if what I was interested in doing was maximizing consumer surplus here, I would... I would force Amazon to set the commission rate to negative infinity and get everyone to come in and, and, and be better off. So, I, you know, that there should be some trade off against these fixed costs of entry. And uh, it's just some, some, something to, to think about. The action here is coming from uh, entry. And so these fixed costs are playing an important role in, in the model. And so I would have appreciated understanding a little bit better to think about what these fixed costs are and, and where they come from 
and in particular the extent to which they're endogenous. So, you know, I mean, one, one big thing for these um, small sellers is, do I have to set up a distribution network or can I use Amazon's distribution network? You know, if Amazon is doing fulfillment for me, is that like a reduction in, in the fixed cost for, 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 these, for these rivals? Um, would the story be very different with a two-part tariff rather than with, with just a percentage story? Um, I don't know, but, but I, I wanted to know. Um, so I think those, those were the things that, that, that I wanted to say. Like, I wanted to understand the fixed cost better, you know, these, these Gumbel properties, um, two-part model, two, sorry, two-part tariff. Ah, the other thing, so it seems that every time I get to discuss a paper, it's about Amazon being a reseller. So the last paper I discussed was, uh, you know, um, by, by Andre, Tathau and Julian. And there, all of the action came um, with the outside option to the platform. You know, it was kind of the competition for, for the platform and the direct sales channel. So Patrick asked this question, and there with the endogenous outside option, they got kind of almost opposite results. So, so that, that, that would seem one to think about. Now, uh, I'm actually not completely uncomfortable with thinking of Amazon as the only game in town or you know, for the, for the Apple Play Store as the only game in town, but I, I, I think it's something to be aware of at least. Um, going back for a second to the to the big picture, the paper sort of started out by reminding us of the and, and Aslam's presentation as well of these key concerns of the of the investigation. This using the data for your own product decisions, uh, steering another self preferencing and, and distorting access. The paper is primarily focused on the last one. I think. I mean, I think. I think this uh, change in T is about affecting the access of, of, of the third parties. And so, first of all, I think it'd be helpful for the paper to kind of, you know, having set up this motivation to, to be direct about what what it's addressing. We had a little bit on steering at at, at the end. Um, so that was helpful. Um, you know, one thing on, on, on steering and also in the model, I didn't exactly understand how to think about this capital M, this, this mass that the, um, that the uh, own product, uh, Amazon's own product sells because, you know, demand ultimately is endogenous. So thinking of it as the size of demand is a little bit confusing. I think that Yossi had a related uh, question around the the, the the sort of micro foundation here and how to think about this M. Um, you know, one aspect that wasn't talked about at all, but I think is is one that people do worry about is how to think about the, the sales information from others and, and what that does. Um, and that, that's a that's a subtle issue. I mean, look, one, one paper doesn't have to address everything and I, I don't think it should, but you, you should be clear about it and having sort of set up, uh, you know, these are the key issues. If you're not going to address them, you should tell us <laughs> um, what the effect of those other issues are and the extent to which they interact with this. You know, I mean, there's the sales data. Should I think of that as affecting the platform's quality or the size of demand M? Does that make a, a big difference in the model? Uh, I'm not sure that it, that, that it does here. Um, it, 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 I mean, having set that up, it would be useful to, to return to that. Um, I'm probably out of time, but I, in any case, I don't have much more to say. Uh, I, I, you know, I didn't, I hadn't thought through this mechanism before. There's, there's a lot of kind of cool modeling technique in the paper as, as well. Um, you know, I, I think the presentation and the focus shouldn't be on that modeling technique for the, for the sake of technique. Um, because ultimately there's a big question that, that we as a community need to address and, and get to grips with. Uh, and this is a, a, a good help on that path. Thank you, Eski. Um, a lot of, uh, lots of uh, comments from, from him. So rather than answering all of them, maybe if you can pick one and answer shortly, and then we have a couple more questions. Thank you. Maybe I can just say thank you. No, I uh, I pick up the. Uh, I think you're completely right. So 
just maybe uh, start from the last points about the policy implications. So for our first objective in this paper is come up with some tractable framework. And then we, of course, would like to use that to address all of you know, potential policy questions like tax and steering. And also, I think one can introduce the uncertainty of demand and platform having some information that the third party seller is not having that. And this could be studied once we get the tractability and all these techniques and the modeling assumptions basically are really getting there for in terms of tractability, because we know that it's so hard to get this tractability in this, you know, two sided market models and at the same time being realistic to capture their facts. So that's the, that's the first step, basically. But I completely agree, given that this is a working paper draft that we send you. So we were not very clear about what we are doing or planning to do at the beginning. But you are right. I mean, in the right final write up, we will be very clear about this. And, uh, and then the, the issue about the, like, I agree, this direct channel is important. Uh, though we have other important differences from the Haju and et al. paper, uh, for instance, they have uh, homogeneous products, so they never get hybrid mode profitable uh, unless they have a direct channel. So they generate hybrid mode basically from the direct channel, but we have hybrid mode profitable because of variety introduced by the third party product. So product differentiation is crucial here. And they have mixed strategy equilibrium. And so it's hard to make direct comparison, but I agree that we have to make and um, clear, clarify this. Two part tariffs, as long as we have homogeneous sellers, we work on this. If we introduce two part tariffs, then the platform captures everything from sellers. So how realistic is this? So we were also questioned on this dimension when we had the other paper. And, but we have also extension in the current paper on the heterogeneous sellers in their qualities. So then we have some inframarginal sellers that enjoy some surplus. And that would make also reason to go for the total surplus analysis because currently sellers have zero profit anyway. So that's why we only consider consumer welfare. But if we have heterogeneous sellers, then I think what matters for us is that the platform cannot capture their total surplus. And that we capture by saying that you just impose commissions rather than having very rich contracts that enables the platform to capture everything. But you are right, you are right pointing out, so this should be also clarified. Thank you again. And the tail properties, I leave uh, Simon to address that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, <laughs> uh, thanks, Azem. Uh, let's see, there were a couple of questions. So the first one was by uh, Yossi Spiegel. Uh, Yossi, are you here? Do you want to ask the question yourself? Yes, well, I, I, I was wondering about the micro foundations of the demand structure, but I guess uh, it's uh, the usual, uh, the usual uh, discrete choice uh, setup, isn't it? Yes, so we think about is uh, so you can think about like there like a you know continuum of products and mass of them is owned the, owned by Amazon, but then every other product is infinitesimal and owned by the independent sellers. Okay, and then we if we have this uh, IID draws, basically what we are telling is that you know Amazon product because it tell Amazon or the platform owns a mass has a higher max draw because it has a max of you know, the max of uh, M draws, uh, mass of the draws. So that's why it gives a, you know, presence of the Amazon product. But again, what we are assuming there is the Amazon products are symmetric. Okay, so they all generate the same VA. Uh, so this interpretation applies and, uh, and this is, you know, this is one micro foundation. And this model also adopted by, again, trade literature and in the different ways, but I think this is the micro foundation that we have uh, found from this literature as well. And is it realistic to assume that uh, otherwise all products have the same uh, substitution uh, uh, properties? Very good question. So we also think about introducing some nested structure. This is work in progress. Um, I shouldn't promise more on that, uh, but you're right. Uh, maybe substitution, uh, say, because there's another thing, for instance, Amazon fulfillments, right? So uh, then that also adds some kind of Amazon thing on third party product, which is different from an uh, independent third party product own fulfillment. So we think about introducing this type of uh, differentiation uh, difference between the nests and within the nests, a different differentiation. So 
nested structure, but uh, we haven't finalized this uh, yet. But currently, you're right. We assume symmetrically differentiated products, yeah. OK. OK, thank you. Uh, we have a few questions still. So uh, Michele, Polo, Michele, do you want to ask your question? Even though Simon already sort of answered succinctly. But yeah, yeah, I think that Simon already confirmed my intuition, yes. OK. Um, Gary, uh, Gary had a question. Gary, you want to? Right. Well, Simon answered it also, but yeah, I. But he, but he said yes. He said yes to both. So I thought I, maybe. But I, I had the same, you know, question that Heskey had: is that this, it's, this dominant effect is that uh, consumer surplus is lower with uh, higher quality, and so you would want to ban Amazon. But there's. There's this issue that, you know, why are, aren't consumers getting some of the benefit of this higher quality? It's like, you know, getting all the pass. There's no, there's like a negative pass through um, in this paper. And I was kind of wondering why, why consumers don't get any of the benefits of this higher quality product. And that, you know, all this is steer, you know, you're steering the consumers to the higher quality product and consumers get none of the benefit. Uh, from this, and I, I had a, a kind of a follow-up question, um, which is that if you ban, uh, and this is a question I already asked you, Islam, uh, last time you presented, but I thought that it would be interesting to see if you have thought about it. Also, that if you ban uh, Amazon from uh, selling its, uh, from from using the hybrid product, there's a possibility that it might instead of becoming a pure reset, a pure uh, platform, it might want to become a, a pure re, a, a pure seller. And uh, have you thought about the, 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 the trade-off then? Yes, I think you're right. Uh, this is basically choice between pure reseller versus pure platform. Uh, we did not, we thought that this was not the most, you know, the most important choice that policymakers are interested in. Basically, they were more asking to question of pure marketplace versus hybrid. But you're right pointing out when it would become, you know, if I ban in between region, how, what would happen? So we can say that, you know, if the quality of the platform is closer to this lower cutoff point, then platform chooses the pure marketplace. And if it is closer to the higher cutoff point, then it chooses the pure reseller mode in the model. But again, we don't have any other reasons uh, to go for a volume business, for instance. So there are no like, a, you know, fixed costs for Amazon. You know, one can also argue that, you know, this uh, retailing business is costly. So we have the Andrea, Julie and Julian, they have paper basically arguing that why retailing is costly and why marketplace uh, models are very effective because of this reducing the marginal cost or the cost of activities. And we don't have that in the model. So if you had other things, uh, then it makes even less likely that the platform goes for this uh, reseller mode. But I mean, that kind of, it's a theoretical question, but I don't know how practically relevant to consider Amazon turning itself a retailer suddenly. In, uh, I, given that it has a very big, processing happening on the marketplace. Oh, well, at, least in, at least in some segments. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but it's true. It started as a retailer, right? So this is another evolution of Amazon. Amazon started as a retailer of books and it turned itself a marketplace. But we have the Apple, the opposite direction. So it started as a marketplace and then it introduced its own apps. So it's an interesting question why, you know, we have these two different paths. So we are not, yeah, this is a I agree. Uh, yeah. So I think one needs to compare in the other questions. So if I have this, you know, choice of pure reseller, what I am doing is I am the monopoly, right? I put my monopoly markup. But if I am offering the marketplace mode, okay, I create some kind of distortion by taxing them, but it's not a monopoly, you know, right? There's some competition. So that will be the trade-off that one needs to uh, look at to analyze uh, you know, which mode dominate. But I think as long as the quality of the Amazon product is higher, 
maybe the monopoly mode might be better. I don't know. So I'm just speculating, but there might be some, uh, yeah, room for further investigation. There. Okay, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I jumped in before you had a chance to answer Gary. So, so I don't know if there was something you wanted to. No, I, I mean, we are already time. I'm happy to answer, but uh, if people, you know, so, okay, want so, to stop. So uh, you're right, uh, you're doing my job, <laughs> timekeeper. Um, so this is the end of the hour. So we'll stop the recording now, or actually, do I? Maybe there are some interesting things uh, that, that are going to happen, but I think the rules are that I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, but we still have a few questions. Okay, so some people are, uh, are supposed yeah. to ask their questions now. Uh, so, but anyway, those of you who want to leave, you may do so now uh, without offending the, the speaker. So thank you a lot, Aslem. Uh, thank you. Thank you. 